I got two of these things just so I can tear one apart. Let's get into it. I was wondering how I was going to decide which one to tear apart, uh, but the choice became pretty obvious once I opened up my second one. Uh, the fan in the middle of the pop bumper is, is much louder on this one. I might be able to fix that once I tear into it. But here, take a listen. That's the fan motor in my first machine. And here's the motor in the second machine. Sounds like it might need to be adjusted or lubricated. So I think I'll tear that second machine apart. And while I'm in there, see if I can fix that. There are a few different reasons that I want to open this machine up. First off, the ball likes to get stuck in this scoop up here, and you have to hit the left flipper pretty hard to get it out sometimes. I bet if I could open it up and get to the play field, I could probably fix that. Second, once I started looking into how the bonus works, I was kind of disillusioned by it. It's just 2% of your score, and these lights on the play field don't really mean anything, they just increment with time, and the indications on the play field of advanced bonus here, here, and here don't really advance the bonus at all. So I started thinking, I wonder how easy it would be to replace the microcontroller inside of this with an Arduino or a Teensy and come up with my own rule set. And then last, I just like taking pinball machines apart. And I think it'd be pretty cool to take this one apart and see how it works. All right, let's get into it. These metal legs come off with four screws a piece. And they're held on with these with four nuts a piece. With the legs off, it's a bit easier to get to the underside. Underneath, you can see the battery compartment, the power switch, and all the screws that hold everything together. I'm guessing that these four screws hold the entire playfield mechanism to the wood. And maybe those two screws there are holding the head onto the cabinet. Let's see, let's take the batteries out first and make sure there aren't any screws inside the battery compartment. screws in there. So I'm wondering if the whole thing will come out if I just take these four screws out.
feels like this whole cabinet might lift right off. Especially in the front. Gotta be careful it didn't fall off the table. Yeah, there we go. Start button. See the clipper buttons must just hit a mechanism here. I'd like to remove the head so I don't have it hanging off the side of my desk like this, but I'm not exactly sure how it's going to come off. I think I'll try these two screws here. Let's see if it starts to get loose. Also, two more screws here. those two recessed screws. Let's try those. Looks like there's a ribbon cable. And maybe I need to pull those screws out some more. figure out where that ribbon cable goes and how to detach it. It looks like this cover here that was held on by the two screws that were holding the head might just slide right out. There we go. And there's the ribbon cable that must end up on the play field somewhere so we'll have to get into that or the head to disconnect it it looks like there's some more slack in this cable in the head uh, as a connector 
Oh, that'd be nice if that were a connector. It is. Oh, lots of slack too. Okay, great. All right, let's lay this down. And let's see about getting that detached. All right. Looks like it just might pull apart and I have to remember that probably pin one is marked as red on both sides. Let's just see if this comes apart like this. I'm gonna have to look at the other side of this connector and see how it comes apart. Okay, I think I finally got it now. Kind of have to pry at the edges a bit to release the locking tabs while pulling it apart. Uh, it was harder than I expected. There we go. Okay. Head separated from playfield. Alright, let's get into the head. Let's do these four screws on the back. Maybe they're holding this plastic panel in. So here's a closer look at the back of the, uh, I guess I'll call it a translate. Um, looks like we've got probably three LEDs mounted on little PCBs and a PCB controlling the score displays and those LEDs. Let's see how close I can get in here. Just a couple of screws holding this board on. Let's see if we can get that off. Nothing interesting on there.
Okay, cool. I'll put one second, those boxes back here. Yep. Just a single LED. There's some silk screen on it. Let's just get a picture of that just in case it's interesting. So I've been taking a look at this Nuvatun N55P chip on the back box board. It looks like it's mainly an LED controller, or at least that's what it's used for here. Um, it's got an SPI interface that I'm guessing a board in the cabinet on the playfield is using to communicate uh, to this chip in the back box. And I'm thinking, um, originally I was thinking it was only controlling the score displays and the three LEDs in the back box. But I think it's probably doing more than that. Um, so these are the connections that are routed between the cabinet and the back box um, you've got so it's these connections here um, through this ribbon cable so we've got uh, uh, first off this uh, BP07 I think it's probably mislabeled it probably should be BPC7 it's one of these pins here uh, it's actually not populated this this uh, jumper isn't populated. So that that first pin uh, isn't, isn't doing anything. But the next one, uh, VCC, I'm guessing is power from the playfield uh, to the back box. Then CSB is uh, chip select for that N55P chip. So when that signal is low um, it enables the N55P to receive data from the playfield controller. The next one, um, SCK, is the SPI clock uh, for communications from the playfield controller. And then uh, MOSI is uh, data from the playfield controller to the N55P. So uh, I haven't opened up the playfield yet, but there's there's some kind of microcontroller there that's sending data to this chip in the back box, and it does it using uh, the CSB clock and MOSI pins, SPI pins. The next one, uh, BPC BPC6, is one of the I/O pins. Um, on this Nubaton chip and it's routed to the playfield controller and I'm not exactly sure why but my guess is that the playfield controller is uh, either setting that pin low or high to uh, turn on the behavior of this N55P chip so and the back box is normally dark even when the power is turned on until you hit that start button on the front. So I'm guessing when you hit the start button the microcontroller tells this chip to turn on. Uh, and then it starts controlling all the LEDs which has which, which turns the score displays on and turns all the LEDs uh, on in the back box in the play field. So that's my guess what that BPC6 pin is doing. Uh, it's kind of being used as an input to this chip. Um, Next is the ground for uh, the back box connection. And then there's a series of uh, six LEDs, LED P, Q, R, S, G, and K. Um, 
uh, I think those, so they're, they're right here, uh, and they're being routed to, uh, this chip, um, so I think this chip is, is controlling not only the LEDs connected here that are in the back box, but it's also controlling the LEDs that are in the cabinet on the playfield. So it's kind of interesting, I, at, least, at least that's my guess, kind of interesting that the playfield is communicating up to the back box through the SPI pins um, to talk to this chip to control the LEDs, and then this chip is communicating back down to the playfield to control the LEDs that are on the playfield. Uh, they might even be mounted on the same board that the microcontroller is on. So it's kind of doing a, it's kind of going around the world just to control the LEDs that are right next to it. But that's, I think that's the purpose of this chip is, is it's basically an LED controller. So it kind of makes sense. That's my guess anyway. I've just been taking a look for a few minutes. We'll see. So there's three LEDs on the back box, these small boards here, and I noticed something while uh, tracing the connections. Um, there's conformal coding uh, over this PCB, so I can't just touch these traces here. Uh, but uh, so there's there's three ground wires here, the black wires here, here, and here. Um, and I noticed by looking at these traces that uh, this ground wire, this ground, is traced back to this uh, N55P chip here. But the other two uh, just disappear. This one, this one doesn't go anywhere, at least that I can see. Uh, and this uh, trace just stops right past the pen. Um, so, uh, I want, I, I, the other side of this board doesn't have any traces on it, uh, and I doubt that it's dual layer, so the only thing I could think is that these, these two ground traces that just disappear are connected to the ground plane uh, on the, around the outside of the board. So to test that, um, I can connect, in, in continuity mode, I can connect uh, my black lead to the ground pin. Again, this is conformal code, so I can't just touch it here. But uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So down here, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and then I can just barely touch these wires. So, uh, that LED's ground is directly connected to ground, and then this one, this one is too. Uh, but this one up here, so these, those ground traces there and there that just disappear are connected to the ground plane, probably on the right side of this, this uh, header here. This one, I don't get any continuity. And I can grab the solder ball on the bottom too and I don't, I don't get any continuity there. Um, and that makes sense because if I trace that pin all the way back, it goes right to this controller. So it's interesting that these two LEDs are wired one way and this one is wired differently. I wonder if, um, I'll have to go back and watch the gameplay footage, but I wonder if these two are always on uh, and this one is a controlled LED, so the ground is being controlled um, by this controller, whereas these grounds are maybe just always grounded to uh, the batteries in the cabinet. Uh, it's just interesting. Okay, I think I have it figured out. So. LEDs P, Q, R, S, G, and K are controlled directly by the Nuvatun controller. So I'm expecting to see, when I open up the playfield, that there are 
uh, some current limiting resistors for each of these LEDs. Uh, and probably since they went to the trouble to putting each of them on a separate pin on this controller that they can be controlled independently. So those are the LEDs in on the playfield. Now for the LEDs in the back box there are three of them. Uh, I called them X, Y, and Z because they aren't labeled on the circuit board. Um, X, LED X, looks like it's controlled independently. So we've got power coming from uh, VCC from the batteries going through a zero ohm resistor. Um, there's no connection to this transistor here, it just goes underneath it. Um, current is limited by R2, which is 184 ohms. I measured that with a multimeter. It goes out to the LED daughter board, and then power is uh, grounded through the Nubiton controller. So it looks like LED X can be controlled independently. Um, that LED is right here, I think. Nope, over here. So you, we might be able to see a gameplay footage that this LED flashes independently of these two. The last LED in the back, the last two LEDs in the back box, I've called uh, Y and Z, are wired differently. Um, so they go through this PNP transistor Q2, uh, and it looks like they're both controlled simultaneously uh, by the Nubiton controller. So we should see those two lower LEDs on either side of the translate always being on or off together. Taking a closer look at the traces on this board, you can see that the SPI pins on that ribbon cable go straight to the N55P controller without passing through any other components. There's no resistors or any other components in the way. Straight connection from the playfield to the back box controller. Same thing with the pin labeled BP6. It takes a straight path from the ribbon cable to the controller. I'm still thinking this is a wake-up pin. There's a mention of a wake-up pin in the data sheet for that N55P chip and I bet that they've assigned that to pin BPC6. So when you hit the start button, it wakes the controller up and enables its behavior. back box is pretty well sorted out. Let's take a look at the play field. Got several screws here, 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 here. Hmm. We'll start with the ones outside, see how that works out. Mm -hmm. 
seems to loosen things up a bit. Yeah, that was it. to get the battery compartment out of the way so we can see what's going on with the battery compartment off we get a much better view of what's going on Looks like through this connector we've got speaker, uh, the power and volume switch, and power and ground from the batteries. There's a connector below it that goes to the motor that runs the fan in the middle of the pop uppers. That's connected via, via a uh, uh, rubber belt to the actual fan. You can see the uh, flippers are just mechanical, and this is interesting. This bar here, when you push this flipper, it mechanically lifts the bar. There's a fulcrum here, and it tries to push the ball up through the uh, out of the little scoop. Doesn't do a very good job, though. So I probably want to take this off and maybe put a little piece of felt. Uh, on top of there to raise it up a little bit, maybe push the ball out harder. Um, there's the ribbon cable connector, and just like in the back box, this BPC7 uh, pin, if you trace it, I think it goes to a, a jumper that's not populated. Must have been some feature or some diagnostic connection that they didn't, that they didn't go through with in the final product. Um, you can see the start button goes to a little connector. There's a connector over here, and I'm not sure where that goes. I'll have to pull the board out and look at the other side. Um, and then most importantly, there's a large daughter board here uh, where the controller for everything is, and it's covered up by some annoying epoxy. So I can't see what it is. But the pins are labeled, so we should get a better look at that. I'm having trouble getting this connector off, so I wonder if it has a locking tab. I think I might try to take the circuit board up. So to do that, it looks like I have to remove the lever for the scoop. one came out easily. Then it looks like this metal surround might just lift out. Um, if I take these two screws and maybe just this one out. Looks like it just might lift up. We'll have 
have to lift it around the battery cover. Oh, you know what? It's snapped on. Looks like there are little snaps right here and here. And also right there. And then three in the back. There's two clips back here. Right there and right there. And I was able to push those in with my finger. And when I did, the playfield glass plastic started coming out so it looks like the playfield glass is clipped to the metal and the metal is uh, sandwiching the PCB the playfield and the glass together so now that I've got these two tabs out there's one over here that looks like this was going over the top of the opto and this was going over the top of that opto like these are right here fall out but that's somewhere safe it's a pretty heavy metal ball This is the flap that stops the ball from going backwards through the trough. Um, hmm. Ah, I can get the plunger out now. Alright, okay, so it feels like if I put this back down again, the play field might just come, or the metal surround might come right off. Yeah, it feels like it might. Definitely metal. This is pretty heavy. the same screws that we're using the other stay over there for the lever. Keep those with that. Okay. Ruby cable's loose. I'm gonna watch the start button over here. Is that like it like it held up on that? I'd like to remove this PCB, the main PCB. Uh, I think to do that, I'm going to have to 
detach this belt and also uh, take the flippers off because they cross over this part of the PCB. Uh, also have to detach the start button. Looks like Alright, it looks like the PCB should be clear to come out. Alright, so it looks like there is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six screws holding it on. I should probably pull off the start button connector. Just pull the switch out, but oh well. Alright. I'm wondering, there's the LEDs poke through the play field, and the optical sensors also poke through. So hopefully everything just lifts out. Looks like I don't have enough slack to go around that motor. And also these connectors are going to have to come off. So all those cables that I was wondering what those are, those go to the electrical contacts that are registering hits on switches under the play field. Hmm, well, let's take a different look at this. Turns out popping off the motor was key. Um, two screws here, and this stay just lifts right off. Uh, and then since the motor doesn't directly drive the fan, it drives it through a pulley, the whole motor is able to just lift out. It doesn't go through the play field at all. And then once the motor um, is disconnected, then the PCB can lift up uh, as long as everything is free from the play field there. The PCB can lift up and we can get to the underside where the LEDs and the optos are and also where the top of the connectors are uh, so I can release the little locking pins. I I think if I just pulled hard enough, they come off. But I've already almost stripped one of the wires from my um, needle nose pliers slipping off the connector when I was trying to pull it off. And they're too small for me to get my fingers in. So I'm hoping I can just slide a screwdriver uh, under those locking pins on the connector connectors and slide them off. That way I can pull the whole entire PCB off from the playfield uh, and remove the uh, battery compartment from it. I've got the playfield separated from the PCB now. Um, let's take a look at the playfield first. So if we flip this over we can see the playfield side. You 
you can see all of the LEDs and we can reference those to where they're at on the play field. Um, these three here are the bonus lights and then the 10x multiplier. Looks like we've got um, LEDs on the slings, LEDs on these obstacles here, LEDs behind the stand-ups, and then one each on the three pop bumpers. Uh, these black things that are sticking up from the PCB are optical switches. So just like on a real pinball machine, if the ball crosses and breaks this beam here, it registers as a switch hit. So we've got uh, one of those in the ball trough, uh, one in the chute, and one in the scoop over here. Um, let's look at the the targets on the playfield. I suspect that these are linked together. Uh, the game doesn't seem to score the left sling differently from the right sling or the left stand up differently from the right stand up. So um, I'm guessing that these are all tied together. So we'll do uh, play field. Yeah, those are the same switch and the stand up. Same switch. Probably same here. Same here. Um, and probably all these pop ups are the same too. Um, but they are distinct from the pops are distinct from the stand ups. Oh, the ground's the same. All of them? That's interesting. But the target itself is different. So, we've got uh, one, two, three distinct optical switches. Um, the slings, the stand-ups, and the pops. Um, if we take a look at, I was just looking at the play field here. Um, so the three pops are really just one switch. Two stand-ups are just one switch. The slings are just one switch. Um, but it looks like each of the LEDs, on the, on the other hand, at least here, is labeled distinctly. Um, it's, probably, it's possibly easier to see on this side. Um, uh, text is pretty small. But uh, LED, P, O, N, S, G, F, E, W, Q, R, L, K. They're all at least lettered distinctly. I don't know if they can be controlled distinctly. But they're separated on the PCB. I was taking a look at the playfield kind of mechanically instead of electrically. Um, on this particular playfield, the ball as it went up the chute tended to get stuck right in this area. Um, and I was feeling this piece of plastic here, there's a little lip uh, on it. It protrudes out this way, uh, probably a bit more than it should. I bet if I were to file this down, uh, so as the ball went past here, it had more space right at this, at this lip, I bet it wouldn't get caught as frequently. Um, and I had thought, as soon as I started playing this game, I... I had wished that the, the scoop ejected better. My first instinct was to file away the plastic on the play field. Um, this, this edge right there, uh, right where the arrow points. 
so that when the scoop pushes it, uh, where when the actuator pushes it out, uh, the ball would have an easier time crossing over that lip of the play field to get back into play. So maybe just filing that edge down uh, on this side. But but once I took a look at how the eject mechanism works, it seems like it might be better to uh, just put something on top uh, of that the kicker. Uh, so it pushes the ball up higher. But I think um, it's good to be able to get this apart so that we can address that uh, eject mechanism and file this down, make the ball go up the chute better. It's really, when I feel it, it's, it's really actually a, probably wouldn't show up in the picture, but it's, it's a significant lip uh, sticking out this direction from the edge of this plastic. It'd be better if it were, it'd be better if it were filed down. The next thing I want to do is take a look at this PCB and figure out what this microcontroller does. Now there's 30 different pens on the controller and I've mapped them out and I'm tracing all the paths through the board to try to figure out what each pen does. But sometimes the traces are obscured by the board because it's, it's on a, a daughter board, uh, like a second layer over the, the main PCB. So I end up having to uh, trace connections through uh, between components to figure out where each pin actually leads. It's going to take some time. I'm going to keep going on it, and I'll see you in the next video.